Hello and welcome to a yet another edition of Dr. K's Psychobabble. Today we're going to be taking a little bit of an adventure into developmental psych. At a real early in my classes in developmental psych, I covered this particular topic, and that is the developmental clocks. Now, the point of studying developmental psych is that it is the application of the study of psychology, but we add the element of time. How do things change over time? If you take an introductory psychology class, you'll learn about memory, you'll learn about personality, you'll learn about learning, you'll learn about motivation, all kinds of different things. But then developmental psych comes along and says, well, how do these things change over time? If I'm gonna look at somebody when they're five years old and talk about memory, how does that differ from somebody when I study them at 22 years old in terms of memory. So the theories that come from developmental psych help us to understand not only the details and properties of psychological processes, but how they change over time. Now the analogy for time that we use is the clock. Not really an analogy, it's an instrument that measures the passing of time. We use clocks all the time. It's actually a very important part of Western civilization and world society. When we started calculating time, we really entered into the modern era and it changes the way we think and the way we interact with the world. So the field of psychology and developmental psychology in particular uses a clock to identify four different timelines that are simultaneously happening in a person's life. And each one of those timelines marks specific expectations that we would have for things changing and impacting the way in which we experience the world and the way that we develop and mature and change over time. So here we have our graphic. I have my clocks. I have time as the element in here. And we're going to be taking a look at four developmental clocks. And I'll be spending some time in each one of them describing that specific timeline and how it relates to our psychological development. The first one is the biological clock. Probably the most famous, probably the most well-known is the biological clock. You have heard people talk about the biological clock. They can hear the biological clock ticking. It may refer to a person's desire to have children or to move on in their career, or they, they get that first gray hair and those, you know, those kinds of things. And the biological clock is exactly that. It is the timetable of the expression of our genetic code. It is our aging and bodily maturation process. Now we know that that's important for psychology because abilities, ideas, brain capacity, all of that has a timeline and they change in relation to our biology. Brain development produces some of the other clocks, but it has that biological component. So the biological clock really has to do with our maturing, our biological aging, the processes such as puberty, and then into aging, and the decline, and each one of those things having to do with our bodies. Now the next clock, very closely related to the biological clock, is the psychological clock. Now this is another timepiece. Now the psychological clock refers to the changes over time that we recognize in each one of those psychological processes that come as a result of biological changes as well, but our ability, let's say, in my example from the beginning, in memory, our ability to remember things changes over time as a function of our biology, but we can look at it separately as a psychological process that moves along. Because 
That's not the only factor. Biology is not the only factor that affects it. Practice, being in school, actually having social expectations to memorize things, that enhances it as well. So clearly connected to the biology, but these psychological processes change as a function of how they interact in the world as well. But we can track those along their particular pathway. Now, when I have the discussion about the comparison between the biological clock and the psychological clock, I like to point out, let's say, the aspect of the psychological clock, such as emotional maturity, the ability to handle responsibilities, the ability to handle stress, emotional intelligence, all of these things that are important. And let's say being a parent. Now, when we look at when we would expect those abilities to happen along the normal lifespan, and we put side by side the biological time at which people become able to have children, that's my example, is the psychological clock which dictates when we are mature and able to handle the responsibility of having children is not necessarily in sync with our biological ability to have children. So you can see that unlike those spy movies where everybody sits around and they synchronize their clocks, sometimes our psychological clock is out of sync with our biological clock. And there's a mismatch, and that can be problematic. Now, I will caution and say that individuals who, let's say, have found themselves pregnant as a young person, to keep with my example, there's all kinds of examples of this, but to keep with that example, people who have found themselves pregnant, sometimes those situations have caused a tremendous amount of growth and maturation in their psychological clock, and they are well able to handle the responsibility of becoming a parent, even though it's early in life. And certainly we know individuals who waited until later to have their kids, and they're still not mature enough to have kids. So let's face it, those clocks are not necessarily talking to each other, but we understand that they're both clicking at the same time. Now the next clock I find really interesting because as a teacher of both sociology and psychology, I find this clock very interesting, and that is the social clock. Now, the social clock has less to do with our ability to socialize and have friends and be able to interact in groups and society and whatnot. That's really kind of resting with the psychological clock in terms of garnering those skills. What the social clock really looks at are society, or let's be very specific, society's culture, meaning the norms and expectations that society has for your behavior, your maturity, your abilities, your maturation, your emotional stability, all of these during your lifespan. When do we expect those things to happen? Now we can look at a clear social clock related to the biological clock. When do we believe children should be potty trained? Now we know the biological clock largely determines when that's going to happen. When the cognitive abilities to recognize that you have to go to the bathroom and the willful ability to withhold the satisfaction of just being able to go, that decision-making is largely a result of biological maturation on its own time clock. No matter how many times you sit in the bathroom with that kid, they are going to go to the bathroom when they are biologically ready to do so independently. Yet, in our society, we have expectations as to when that should happen. So this is the should clock. What should you be doing at a particular age? And we see manifestations of this all the time. We see, when should you start going to school? When should you have your first date? When should you move out of the house? When should you get married? When should you be paying your own bills? When should you stop working? All of these shoulds are society's impact 
It's request, sometimes demands on us being in line with the social expectations of quote unquote acting our age. And when we don't do those things, we're an aberration. We are abnormal in a way. And so let's say throughout my career in teaching, I have always had a substantial number of what we would call non-traditional students in my classroom, meaning students that are not 18, 19, 20 years old going to college. The social clock says that's when you should go to college if you're gonna go. Now then we have classrooms full of people who are not that age. They're older, sometimes younger, they're in high school, homeschool, those kinds of things. We get a variety of age. One of the really most important reasons why I like working in a community college is that diversity that's in there and that non-traditional nature are individuals that are essentially breaking the social clock rules. They're saying, no, I'm going to go to college at a time when it's right for me, when I'm motivated, when I'm done that first job of raising kids or that dead end job that I didn't like or the job that I loved and went away and I'm going to come back to school and that's when I'm going to do it. And they're really challenging the social clock. They themselves have expressed to me how that can sometimes be challenging because they, even though they might not have this term or they know the breaking the laws of the social clock, they, they know that they they have to, that they're doing something unexpected. They're going to be in a classroom of individuals who are not of their generation and they may feel that they don't fit and they don't gel. They might feel lost. They might not feel connected. And truth be told, I believe the magic of the community college and increasingly so community oriented universities and whatnot is that once those individuals have entered the classroom, they actually don't necessarily experience that at all. That they fit in, they become leaders in the classroom. Their work ethic that has been tested and tried in the workplace transitions and they are tremendous role models for the other students that are in the class. Now the final clock, another very interesting one, is the historical clock. Now this particular clock clicks in a different way. This has to do not with your personal history, but with, although it's related to that, but with when you were born and the societal events and expectations that you had that are different than other generations. In fact, this is the clock that gives us the millennials and the baby boomers and you know the different generations that we have this is the clock that sort of says oh if you're born it between these and this years you have these sort of characteristics because of the social world that was going on when you were young and as you developed and whatnot that shaped the way you experienced the world now historical clock things are sometimes fun when we meet someone who graduated in the same year that we did we can reflect on the the way life was, what hit songs were around, what we did for fun before video games, you know, back when you used to have to put a quarter in the video game or a token or something like that, the, the arcade scenario, what play was like, what we did. We have often a sense that we were never bored, even though I think that that's not true. That's just sort of Pollyannish looking back. But specific to, let's say, in my historical clock, I spend time sometimes in class just talking about the things that were meaningful for me, that were symbolic of the age that I grew up in. I grew up when the cell phone or the car phone was attached to the car. I remember very early in life, eight tracks. I remember having a turntable with records and then put the stylus down and the needle and the quality of your stereo was very dependent on the quality of your needle. Now that of course is coming back, but the, um, but nonetheless, these are things that help us identify the age in which we grew up in. And they're very formative to us in terms of our value systems, our expectations closely associated with that social clock and closely associated with conflict with intergenerational people. So you may have 
elderly people in the household that have a different timeline for their social clock because of their historical clock and they may find it frustrating dealing with other members of the family who are not living according to those patterns and expectations of the social clock that they had as children. And so there's a lot of so communication is important, understanding that the historical clock defines where we're coming from, but that the social clock changes over time. For good or for worse, it does change. Society does change. So here we have it. We have our four clocks, the four simultaneously ticking clocks, we have the biological clock, psychological clock, the social clock, and the historical clock. And these can help us understand the patterns in which we experience change over time and really envelop the entire field of developmental psych. So that's it for now. Hope you remember to subscribe and make sure that you click the little bell or the button that has to do with getting notifications for more videos. So have a great day.